Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Today, on Tuesday, we are celebrating the book launch of Building Board Champions by Julia C. Patrick, the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. But before we jump into this great conversation with Julia, we want to make sure that we take a moment to celebrate and thank our sponsors for The Nonprofit Show that bring this show to you Monday through Friday without fail. Uh, to celebrate the nonprofit sector and bring professional development right to you, whether you're viewing us live, watching the, the video on some streaming service, or listening to our podcast. So a huge thank you to Bloomerang, the American Nonprofit Academy, of course, the Nonprofit Show, the Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So again, much gratitude to these sponsors for supporting the Nonprofit Show every single day of the week. We also want to celebrate our cadre of co-hosts, uh, just a great group of folks, uh, very diverse uh, in their experience, where they are in the region uh, across the country. So again, we want to celebrate all of those. That includes Julia, Mitch, Miko, Meredith, Sherry, Wendy, and myself, Tony Bell from Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Awesome. Awesome. You know, Tony, I love the co-hosts. I think they bring such a different cadence and process and the regional part of their work, I think is riveting. It, you know, it's just riveting. And so thank you. No, I of love course. Yeah, I love that you um, are talking about that. I really, really do. So, Julia, spotlight on you today. So, our very, very, very special guest who is uh, in the hot seat for a change. Uh, again, Julia C. Patrick, the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. And today, Julia, we are celebrating you, author Julia C. Patrick, and the launch of your new book. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And here we go. I'll, I'll hold it up too. Um, you know, when we were doing the test design on the cover, we chose a color that doesn't work with our green screen, I'm now realizing. But yeah, building board champions. And uh, it's pretty exciting. I, I appreciate, of all things, that you invited me and, and uh, agreed to, to be talking about this. So thank you. Of course. Well, you have so much experience in the nonprofit sector, and folks learn from you every day on the nonprofit show uh, with all kinds of topics. So the first question would be, given all of that experience, why, when you decided to write a book, one, like, why would you write a book? And then given all that experience, why did you decide that boards would be the focus of your shared knowledge? Yeah, that's a good question. And um I have to say, you know, I've, I've been a writer all my life. So for 30 years, I was in the newspaper business. Mm -hmm. And so I had to write on demand. And um, not that I'm the best writer, but I could crank it out, right? And I, I am an award-winning author. So I'm not a slacker, but I'm not <laughs> what I would call a professional, professional high-level writer. Um, I've been more in the publishing side, right? Mm -hmm. And the newspaper business is incredibly different from the book business Ooh, I'm sure. and in the newspaper business I'm asked or in the periodical side of things I'm asked to write columns and criti criticism and thoughts all the time but you know 500 words 300 words you know and so when you have a book you're just like holy moly I could go on and and so um I would say the number one thing that happens in my orbit on a daily basis level. And I would love to ask you this, Tony. And that is, is that people come up to me and ask me about board issues. Mm -hmm. And usually it's pretty scary or negative. And it's like, I have this crazy board member and I don't know what to do, or I can't find board members, or it's, it's always like questions about the board side. And mm -hmm. maybe it's because I'm known for that type of work and training. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like a self-fulfilled prophecy. But um, that's something that I get asked a lot about. And so for me, it was a really a natural thing to talk about, to talk about engagement and how we can build 
champions. I believe that we can build board champions. I really do. I don't mm-hmm. think it's just that one shining star that drops into your lap. I think there are things that we can do as leaders in the sector to build board champions. So, yeah, and it's it's a great question. I'm glad that that you're hearing that and that folks are asking that. When, when we think about your board of directors, they really are the foundation of the organization, right? So you you equate that to building a home. If you don't have a solid, sturdy foundation, everything else is is going to potentially fail. Uh, and so, you know, your board members really have, in many ways, the highest level of accountability when it comes to the success of the organization, and more importantly, the success of the programs that are being delivered to the communities that you're serving. Right. And I think, Tony, I don't know what what you have observed throughout your illustrious career, but, you know, the board are generally are higher functioning community leaders. And mm-hmm. so to me, when they go out, they can be working for you outside that boardroom. Mm-hmm. They can, be, you know, subtly putting their name behind it. They can be like, oh, mayor, you should come see our project or, oh, hey, governor, you should come see our project or, you know, hey, neighbor, you should, you know, but think about supporting us. I mean, it just seems to me that this can be a track that they take um, and that we're not exploiting it enough or or making them comfortable in recognizing this is part of their service. I, I think I think you you said something really smart there, and that is really understanding, engaging their level of comfort, and skilling them up uh, mm-hmm. so that so that they have that comfort level. I mean, in a world of social media, uh, you can really think of your board members as your brand ambassadors. Exactly. Uh, you know, out there really supporting the mission and and bringing in folks that have time, talent, or treasure mm-hmm. uh, to support the great work that you're doing. So uh, we should jump in and talk about some of the content. Uh, What I really loved, a a, a lot of things about the book, Julia, I love. Uh, And it's called Building Board Champions, Activating, Activating, I'll come back to that, Impactful Nonprofit Board Members. And in fact, everything in the book is an activation. Uh, What was it? Up to 34 activations with two bonus activations. Uh, so a total of, of 36 activations. So it's it's a great read, but it, it really gives you, again, activities, things mm-hmm. to do uh, mm-hmm. to tackle whatever that issue may be around building your board champions. That's right. what I got from it. Yeah. And, and that was kind of the spirit with which um, I wanted to tackle this because some of the activations are like, do this before the meeting starts and you do it once and it's, you know, it's five minutes and you're good to go and you Mm -hmm. get everybody centered. Some of them are like, they're going to take the course of that board seat uh, time, or they're going to take a year. I mean, it, it has a lot of levels. Sometimes you just have a board that's like sluggish because it's the middle of summer and everybody's tired and exhausted and it's hot. Right. Sometimes you have like systemic toxic issues that you need to refocus on. And so we kind of talk about these things when all is said and done, you have almost 50 activations in this book because we have items that will help you guide your, your activity level, depending on what it is you need. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And you know, Tony Boards will have a vibe and that vibe changes depending on leadership or what's going on. True. Um, it, it's, it's never the same, right? Right. No, it's, it's never, always, it's never the same. It's never the same. Yeah. Well, there were a couple, if you don't mind me calling out a couple of activations that I, yeah. I saw in the book that I thought were really, uh, I mean, they're, they're all super useful. And, um, and again, I think what I love about the, how it, it demonstrates these activation opportunities. A lot of times you get a book and you read it and you're like, okay, well, what really is the takeaway? Well, every activation is the takeaway, yeah. right? Every activation. Uh, number four I loved was join an employee training. Mm-hmm. I think professional development within the board is super important. And for them mm-hmm. to see, you know, the type of professional learning that employees mm-hmm. for the organization are attending. Um, I thought number 17, I spy with my own eye. And that is just getting out there and seeing what other organizations are doing. Become the client, number 22. And number 28, who am I? 
So mm-hmm. though, again, those were just some that, that I saw that really resonated with me as, as being super important. <laughs> well, I appreciate you saying that. And let's talk briefly is I think it's 28. You'd think I would know all these by heart. Yeah, number twenty-eight um, is who am I? Who am I? Okay, the one before that is is really um, twenty. Ah! Well, it's called dog fooding. It's one of my oh, favorite. Okay. It's one of my favorite topics, and it's very controversial. And the concept is this: that you need to eat your own dog food, right? <laughs> you need to be a client, and so that means if you are in shelter services. You need to know what it's like to go through intake and you need to know what it's like to sleep in your shelter and eat Mm -hmm. the food and see Mm -hmm. what it's like. Mm -hmm. Do you feel safe? Do you not feel safe? Are you shamed? Are you supported? I mean, are you encouraged? And I think that one of the things that is um, so shocking is how few boards do that. A lot of this was modeled after um, the, when we had a lot of civil unrest in our country in the sixties sure. around police, um, police organizations throughout the country run differently, working differently. And um, it became really popular to, you know, be negative against police. And so they started this, this ride along cop campaign. Sure. And they started going into high schools and making it and colleges and making it like a college credit or extra credit so that kids and young people could see what it was like to be a cop, right? Mm-hmm. And they uh, they turned it into a cultivation for a reframing of you know law enforcement and all that. But also, it interestingly enough became a cultivation point for getting young people to go into police force mm. and law enforcement. And so you would never know that if you hadn't. Um, if you hadn't ridden along, if you hadn't seen what it was like. Right. Um, and so anyway, dog fooding is a, one of my favorite topics. It's something <laughs> that is a shocking thing. The expression dog fooding comes from, do you remember when we were kids, the show Bonanza and the father of the Ponderosa ranch was Lauren green. Yes. I remember that. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. So he was hired by the big, big, um, dog food company, Alpo, to do a series of ads. And he basically intimated on these ads that this dog food is so good, I would eat it. I would (laughs) feed it to myself. If it's good enough. Yeah. So, you know, it's called dog fooding because it was like, hell, if this guy thinks it's that good, Uh you know, and he's like the pinnacle of male masculinity, you know, head honcho of a ranch. Sure. It's going to be good enough for my little yapper dog to feed right? So well, dog fooding is something that we, you know, it's shocking to a board because it kind of, you know, it's like, whoa. But I think it's one of those concepts, Tony, that gets people to think about what it's like to be a client. Well, I think that the the example of the ride along with law enforcement is a really good one because I know... For example, in my local leadership experience, most counties or states have a you know leadership Florida. I went through leadership Broward. Part of that curriculum was a ride along uh, with law enforcement. So my guess would be if any of them have participated in any, in any local leadership programming, they may have had that experience and will be able to connect pretty easily to that example. Uh, yeah. I also thought about Covenant House which nationally has their national sleep out fundraiser. So folks raise money and sleep out so that they get a sense of what it feels like for these teens to be out on the street, you know, for a night uh, and to really have that lived experience. So uh, I I love it. I I love that it's controversial and dog fooding certainly makes you think about what the heck is that? (laughs) I know, you know, and I, and I'll, I'll man up. It is a little provocative and sexy. And and when I speak and do trainings, I bring it up and people are always like, Oh, you know, but you got to rattle the cages and that otherwise people are like, yeah, okay. I've heard of that all before, but I think think it's memorable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also you got to make it true because Mm -hmm. I think there's so much. um, One of the reasons why I'm, I'm interested in this is that, um, 
you know, one of my, I was, I served on the board of the nation's largest domestic violence shelter. Mm -hmm. And when I first went to the board meetings, they were held in this like rarefied space, one of the most expensive office spaces, buildings in our city. And you'd look out and it was catered and it was just lovely. And it was like, we were making decisions about women and their children in domestic violence. And I'll never forget the, uh, the discussion I asked, well, why don't we meet on campus? And, and the, the executive director said, well, it's not safe and, and no one, we wouldn't get people to go down. Hmm. And I was kind of like, well, holy crap, that's why we need to go down. Yeah, all <laughs> and, the more reason. yeah. And so once we flipped that switch and started going, the empathy level, the, the need in the, um, the need for more activation from the board and what was important got mm -hmm. really, got really intense. For sure. Well, I know one of the things that we talk about a lot when it comes to kind of board engagement and board recruitment and succession planning are millennials and Gen Xers and, and that kind of convening and, and building of collaboration amongst, amongst those groups. How have you considered that and, and how does that play in, in the content of, of your book? You know, it's so interesting, Tony. Um, thanks for asking that question because it's a good question. I would say right now, for the last probably, even during the pandemic or before and before the pandemic, the last eight to 10 years, my biggest um, call from clients has been to come and talk uh, about this, this change in the demographics of board leadership. You know, we're bleeding off in the silver tsunami, people that look like me. Um, you know, people are retiring out, they're aging out. Sure. And so we've got to get these, these, this next level of group in, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the problems is, is that they have different behaviors and they have different interests and they work differently. Oh, for so sure. There's a big problem with that. And these older um, board members, you know, sometimes there's like a, a conflict. And so I've been spending a lot of time talking about this and how do we reframe what does Mill and Gen Z demographics look like when it comes to board service? And um, I think it's a really healthy discussion because an older demographic might not understand or have any empathy with what the cadence of this younger group is. And then you go the opposite direction too, is that well, they're frustrated. Yeah, well, just, you know, and even when we think about the in real life meetings, right, when board members come together in a room, which, you know, is happening again, I think, in, in, yeah. in, many, in many places across the country, uh, you know, to you might see a, someone sitting at the table while someone's speaking on their phone. It doesn't mean that they're on TikTok. They may be on their phone taking notes or something that the speaker said may have sparked an idea. And so now they're Googling it, researching it so that when they raise the hand to speak to it, they have some other supporting documentation or words to, you know, to validate whatever their thought was. So even recognizing and accepting just kind of the, the different behaviors that you might see in a boardroom uh, that historically might have seemed almost rude are in fact, um, you know, of value. I love that you said that because I think that's very true. And we are seeing more and more board meetings being conducted through board portals where they're being filmed, where all the access, the paperwork is on a tablet or on somebody's laptop. Um, we're not passing out those big board books anymore and all that paper. You know, we're doing it in a digital uh, manner that's highly compliant, highly yeah. traceable. I mean, it's it's very trackable and traceable. Um, so this this piece is, I think, a, a, one of those discussion points is how do we reframe that board service so that folks feel like everybody's engaged? They just look like they're engaged in a different way. And so mm -hmm. um, this has been one of those things that's been hard for the older generation to understand. Mm -hmm. It really, well, really has. It's so, changed. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's real change. And, and you know, it's uh, one of those things that if we don't address it or understand it, then it just builds a disparity within the board. And I think, Tony, what it does is that it cripples the board or nomination committee or individual members 
from saying, yeah, we need to lean into this, this next demographic because what they do is they say, oh, I, we need more people like me. Mm -hmm. All right. Right. Versus saying, no, we need to go, you know, down. I was speaking, um, I speak often with a a national trade organization, a financial network, and um, Mm -hmm. they um, uh, have had me come to a lot of their think tank uh, meetings on how do we get younger board members? Because they're in their, this organization, the average age is in their 70s, like 73. And a lot of them go into the 80s. And whenever I speak, they're always like, oh, Julia, we need someone like you to come on our board. And I'm always like, no, I'm already too old. I'm 60 in my early 60s. You need to be cultivating down. You need to be looking at 50s and 40s and even 30s. And Mm -hmm. so that is such a disparity, right, Tony, in the sense of who do we need and who who should we have? Mm -hmm. Um, And so we have to be thinking about this. Oh no! Thinking about it. No, yeah, absolutely. But uh, and there are plenty of ways to to navigate that, and and lots of actionable items in building board champions. That well, is for thank sure. You. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Um, you can get my book on Amazon, and it'll get mailed to you directly. Um, we have some exciting things that we're doing um, out and about across the country. Book signings, um, you know talking things of that nature. So I'm um, definitely, you can find us and it's a quick read. It's easy. It's a pickup put down. It is. Uh, yeah. And it kind of depending on maybe where you're struggling. Um, I think it's a good thing for somebody who wants to move into board leadership mm-hmm. and they're thinking like, wow, how do I run a meeting and get these folks, you know, rowing in the same direction um, it also at the very end has some uh, pieces on um, b- board cultivation and what to look for. It's not just about gender and ethnicity. It right. talks about everything from language, um, uh, professionalism, like what sectors are your board members coming from? Exactly. Uh, you know, you what part of your community? You don't want everybody that's in the ring living around the golf course, (laughs) country club, right? You know, you want people coming from different uh, areas. And so um, I think it's, it's been fun. It's, I'm very blessed, Tony, and that I've had a family um, engaged in board service for many generations. In the intro of my book, I write about how I drove my grandmother to board meetings Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how I learned to drive, which is scarier than hell. If you think about it, (laughs) my grandmother, Patrick, who was always lovely and never screamed or like, but I'm sure she showed up to several of her board and committee meetings, you know, sweating bullets. um, She was screaming on the inside. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, and she'd always be like, Oh honey, good job. But, um, I have a memory and I don't think I put it in the book, but I have a memory of my grandmother driving my grandmother to downtown Phoenix. She lived in Paradise Valley. We took the drive in downtown Phoenix to a very wealthy woman's home because she was underwriting uh, a big chunk of uh, the the annual symphony ball that was coming up. Mm. And in those days, the Phoenix symphony played in one of the high school auditoriums because we didn't have a symphony hall. They were trying to build a symphony hall. And then I remember my grandmother got the check and then I had to drive her to the resort. It was mountain (laughs) shadows where the the gala was going to be held. And then my grandmother gave the check to the, catering manager, you know, I don't know, mm-hmm. whoever. And mm-hmm. I can, I was, you know, 16. And that was kind of like a, wow, this is how it gets done moment for me. Right. You know? And so, yeah, it's, it's always been a part of my life. Um, I've been in it. I've been witness to it. And so it's been really lovely to be able to talk about it. And That's especially great- with something like you. Yeah, that's a great story. And 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 what you said before that, too, is very true. It's an easy read. It's super informative. You can pick it up. You can put it down. I know you can't see my highlighter, but it's definitely a <laughs> highlighter 
worthy <laughs> book, right? So, uh, so break out your highlighter and don't be afraid to fold the pages if you need yeah. to. Uh, but it's just, uh, it's just, and you'll and you'll come back to it again and again. Uh, another great audience for this book are folks that are aspiring to go next level in their career. And so, when you're thinking about mm-hmm preparing for interviews and questions that you might get about how you would manage a certain board scenario or how you may cultivate your board. A lot of the answers to those types of interview questions can be found in here, I thought. Like there's a lot of strategy in here that folks can bring up during the interview process. So just I love that you that. said that. Thank you. I, You know what? I hadn't thought of that. And um yeah, you're right. That's that's a really cool way to look at this because it does take you from, uh, you know, quick and easy ideas like we mentioned at the start of the show to things that are a little bit more strategic and long term. But I think we've done a good job explaining why you need to do this. And I think a lot of times folks don't realize that that as a, a board member, we are fiduciaries. And, you know, that there are legal implications and compliance. Mm -hmm. implications that we must look at, that we must recognize. And I don't know about you, Tony, but I'll tell you, that's probably one of the biggest shocks that I learned over and over again is how disconnected board members are to this fundamental structure, legal structure in our country about what board service means. No, absolutely. That's why I always say, you know, board members in many ways have the highest level of accountability when it comes to to the organization. So yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah spot on. Well, it's Julia, true. as you know, the time always goes by way too fast on the nonprofit show because <laughs> the guests like you are always super engaging and super intelligent and super passionate about yeah. the nonprofit sector and the work that everyone does. So thank you again, Julia C. Patrick. CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, uh, award-winning author. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we move on to to thank our sponsors, Julia, just real quickly, for those folks that that may have an idea in their head that they want to put into a book, Mm -hmm. what would you recommend be like the first step for anyone that wants to succeed in, in publishing a book? Wow, that's a great question. I'm already writing my second book, um, How to Launch um, Your Own Nonprofit. And because that's, those are the second questions I get asked, like, how do I, I want to start my own nonprofit. What do I do? Uh, Like I can answer that in a hallway or over a cup of coffee. So we're working uh, on that, that book. Um, But I would say the biggest thing is to outline, 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 figure out what it is you want to say and why you want to say it. Mm -hmm. And if you can have those two key things, then, um, you know, it will really, change the way you work and it'll allow you to get going. You know, there are also book coaches out there Mm -hmm. and um, I did not use one, but I I think that there are ways to, to kind of, if you need that help, I did not tell anyone in my family other than my daughter or anyone on my team that I was doing this. Um, I worked on it, um, got it done, got it to the publisher, got it printed And then I actually had it mailed to people in my family while I was away on the Navajo Nation where they couldn't get a hold of me. And they just got it (laughs) through Amazon. And then they're like, what the hell? So, you know, it's it's a it's a process and it's grueling, but it's really great. So I yeah, congratulations. It, It really is such a great resource. So much great information. And I really encourage all of our viewers and listeners to to go pick it up on Amazon. And I'm sure it's available in digital format as well. Uh, but, you know, get get the bound copy because, you know, again, the highlighter, it's a whole lot of fun. So there's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, so again, we want to, again, Julia, thank you so much. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors for the nonprofit show. Again, they bring the show to you every weekday. Uh, Bloomerang, the American Nonprofit Academy, the nonprofit show, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So, Julie, again, thank you so much. Wishing you much success on your book tour, because I'm sure there's a tour coming up. And uh, and as we always say on the Nonprofit Show, what is it, Julia? Please 
stay well. well. So you can do well. 